Hi, in this video we're going to be talking about vertical pitch organization. That's when we play more than one note at a time, commonly called chords. For example, Now, they're quite complicated chords. We're not going to be talking about them. So what we're interested in is the basic chords that we use all the time, made up of a third and a fifth. So if I play something like this, play them all together, we have a simple chord. As we know, we've got a variety of flavors of chords. For example, the major, the minor, and there's a few other ones, for example, the diminished or the augmented. And there's a bunch of other ones as well, but we'll be focusing just on major and minor for today. Just to revise what you probably already know, a major chord, the root, major third, perfect fifth, a minor chord, the root, minor third, perfect fifth. So, in isolation, a chord is static. It doesn't have a tendency to move anywhere. For example... It was just staying there. But once we start using more than one chord, we can sometimes perceive interactions between them. And once we start thinking in terms of building chords on a scale, we have a hierarchy that is created. Suppose we create a scale on note Z, and we call the notes in this particular scale the key of Z major or minor, then note Z becomes the most important note. Everything else is considered in relation to how it relates to note Z. For example, C major. Here are the notes in C major. The most important note is C. And we can build chords on these notes by stacking thirds and fifths on top of them. And we can give these chords labels C major, D minor, E minor, etc. Now these names are independent of what key we're in. They're just absolute names. But if we want to reflect our key hierarchy, we can label them by numbers instead. So the chord built on C, we call 1. The chord built on D, we call 2. E, 3, 4 is on F, 5 is on G, 6 is on A, 7 is on B. Now in classical music we tend to use Roman numerals to do this. If it's a capital, it's major. If it's lowercase, it is minor. Using numbers like this helps us to think in terms of our hierarchies. Now. If we build a scale on the note C, we've got the notes there, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and we've built a C major, a D minor, an E minor, an F major, a G major, an A minor, and a B diminished chord. And you can see the labels. And they've got special names, which I've written there, the tonic, the supertonic, the median, the subdominant, the dominant, the submedian, and the subtonic. Now, when we're talking about this in terms of a hierarchy, I like to think of it as the hierarchy in a business organization. The big boss is the tonic, in our case C. And the deputy is the dominant, in this case G. Then we have a bunch of other chords. Now, some of these chords are the actual workers. For example, F, which is a kind of a preparer, and D minor, 
also a kind of a preparer. And the others are kind of like pretending to be something that they're not. For example, our boss is C major. E minor has got two of the same notes as C major, so sometimes we use that as a substitute. Now, A minor has also got two of the same notes of C major, and we can sometimes use this as a substitute as well. Sometimes we make it stand in for the tonic in a deceptive sort of way. The note built on B, which is a diminished chord, is kind of like the dominant seventh chord, which we don't know about. So that can sometimes stand in for the dominant chord. Using the boss hierarchy that I just made up, we can see that there are three types of chord. Essentially, the boss, the deputy, or the preparer. The boss is the tonic, or a tonic substitute. The deputy is the dominant, or a dominant substitute. And the actual workers are preparers, which are called predominant or subdominant chords. When I went to university, we called them dominant preparation chords. So, it may be obvious, but it's worth stating that in most common music, we start with one chord, go someplace else, and end up on the first chord again. Not all music is like this, but mostly. So, in most of the music we're interested in, it starts at the tonic, goes to the dominant, and goes back to the tonic again. Or, to make it more complicated, starts at the tonic, goes someplace else, ends up at the dominant, and then goes back to the tonic again. Music theory people have looked at a lot of the music that classical composers have done, and they've derived a bunch of practices, and they call these strong chord progressions or functional chord progressions. Now, we can use these practices in pop music as well. And this is represented in this chart. You can find it on the internet or in books in slightly different forms, but I find this flow chart is an easy way to work on it. If you look at the beginning, we start with the tonic, and if you look at the end, we end on the tonic. Just before the end, we have a dominant chord. So we have tonic, go somewhere, dominant, tonic. Now, it is possible to leave out the second column with the three in it, and the third column with the six and the four and two in it. So then we get one, five, one. But if we want to, we can follow the arrows and play the chords that we come across. So we can go from one to say three, to say six, say two, to five, to one. For our purposes, we can use this graph to create chord progressions. And although you can theoretically have chord progressions of any length, for what we're going to do, we're going to create chord sequences that are eight bars long. In each bar, there should only be one or two chord changes. And we don't want it to stay on the one chord for longer than eight bars. Let's have a look at some examples of these strong chord progressions which were made by following the arrows on the graph. The first one. So that sounds like a normal sort of progression. Let's do the second one. That also sounds okay. Let's look at another one. And 
finally, let's look at this last one. So all those chord progressions were made just by following the arrows on that chart. So you may be asking, are these the only types of chord progressions? No, there's a bunch of other types of chord progressions that are commonly used as well. But we are not focusing on those today. The important thing is using this graph we can come up with viable chord progressions.